Sono Valerio Zamboni e questo è l'Ohio Ram Show. I'm Valerio Zamboni and this is the Ohio Ram Show. And thank you, Valerio, for that introduction. We appreciate it. And Valerio, uh, although he lives in Monaco, this weekend is in Borrego Springs, California, where he is riding in the 24-hour World Time Trial Championships just finished, and he came in with a, ta- a distance of 364 miles, which puts him second in the 60 to 69 age category. And if I know Valerio, he would like to have a four up there rather than a three, but I think for uh, that he is a remarkable rider. Thanks a lot, Valerio, for being a great supporter of the show. Today we're going to go up to Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada to visit with Leah Goldstein. And I am Lee Kreider, the host of this show, and we're so happy to have with us someone who's been on my radar for a long, long time, uh, Leah Goldstein from, uh, well, she's a citizen of Israel, aren't you, Leah? And you now live in Vancouver, British Columbia. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. I'm actually a citizen of Israel and Canada. And so I live in Vancouver and in Vernon, British Columbia. So I'm kind of traveling back and forth. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it's so glad to have you here on the show. As I said, you've been on my radar for a long, long time to have you here. Thank uh, you. I remember uh, first becoming aware of you uh, when you did uh, the Race Across America in, in 2011. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's just tell a little bit about uh, the remarkable uh, career that you have had, and then you have a new book, and we want to talk about that. I just want to say it uh, before we get started. I uh, had this couple... Uh, that we had lunch with today from our church, and I told them that I was going to have you on the show and a little bit about you, and they really got excited, but uh, hopefully we'll have uh, everybody else here excited as well. So awesome. we're so, ha- <laughs> so happy to have you with us. Leah, uh, let's start out um, with uh, you were, and I believe, the world kickboxing boxing champion at one point in your life. Uh, t- tell us about that. I was at, um, actually started with Taekwondo when I was nine and I became a black belt. Um, and I was, uh, a junior national champion and I got a lot of, um, warnings for too much contact. So a black belt suggested that I try kickboxing. And one of the reasons why I was good kickboxer, because my father was a boxer. Um, he was a national champion. So you combine Taekwondo and boxing and you get a kickboxer. Uh, so yeah, I went into the you know kickboxing studio and told you know met my my coach Alan Chang and he you know, he gave me a set of rules that I had to follow and you know within three years I was the world champion. For three years, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so I was Canadian champion at fifteen. Um, and then I was challenged again at sixteen. I won another title, and then at seventeen, I won the world championships. Oh, wonderful! I uh, I sometimes catch it. On uh, I think it's the NBC Sports Network here. They'll have a little bit of it. I I've never got into it, but um, uh, well, that just shows a little bit about who we are are going to be dealing with. Now, <laughs> the thing that fascinated no end uh, our friends that we had lunch with today was your life as um, in the Israeli military. Tell us about that. Well, my dream when I was a little kid, I wanted to be James Bond. You know. Um, so I knew I would end up back in Israel and the, in the military is actually mandatory for all citizens. Um, for women, they do two years and men do three years. So I enlisted into the IDF um, after I won my world championships uh, about it, nine months later, I went to Israel and I was actually um, an instructor for Krav Maga, which is Israel's national self-defense. Um, the motto behind that is fight to kill and it's basically using your hands in the most lethal way designed specifically for soldiers and I was also one of the first female commando instructors Um, and that's kind of how my military career started 
And then that's when I transitioned when a course was opening up um, to go into not necessarily the police um, academy. It was a special undercover um, department that picked me up to deal with certain issues that were happening in the Middle East during that time. Well, uh, Leah, I, I saw a video that you did that tells a little bit about how you had to get into this. Uh, it, they didn't just invite you in with open arms, did they? Into the no, into no, they didn't. I remember when I um, when I was released from the military with huge credentials um, and working for an all male, you know, uh, unit. When I went to apply for this course that was opening up and it was actually um, created by the commissioner, um, they denied me because I was a woman. So that was one of my struggles, and um, and it was the first time I ever experienced discrimination. I mean, in the military, I didn't hear a peep, not one time. And so now I was faced with this big obstacle, you know, um, and to me it was a big blow because this was my dream when I was seven years old. So it was a long process to, to fight through that, that, um, that barrier. But I finally, I mean, I guess I pissed off the right people because the headquarters called me and, you know, had a meeting with me um, and, and with the police commissioner. He actually called me a direct call from the police commissioner to come to his office. And something about you had to be there within 30 minutes or something like 30 that? 30 minutes. Yeah, he says, we'll see you in my office in 30 minutes. And so <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay, well, I'm either going to be arrested or they're going to let me in, right? So, yeah, it was um, it was a very stressful drive to, to the north. I mean, I wasn't that far. And Israel is very small. So basically to get from point A to B, it doesn't take that long. And so when I went into his office, um. It was Yaakov Turner was the commissioner, the police commissioner at the time. He was also a general, um, a very uh, powerful general in the military. And he said to me, he goes, you know, oh, you know, you're the troublemaker and kind of, you know, <laughs> he goes, oh, yeah, you're the troublemaker in the Middle East. He goes, I'll make you a deal. He says, um, I'll allow you into this course. But he says, I don't want to hear from you. If you feel like you're being mistreated or they're training you too much or it's too hot, too cold, you don't like your bed, I don't want to hear a peep from you. I go, do we have a deal? And I said, you got a deal. It's a deal. So that was the first step into this course, but it just progressively got worse as I got into it. Like when, you, when we talk about the discrimination and all that kind of stuff, I had a lot of challenges from that was just the beginning. It kind of just escalated as I, as I went into what I really wanted to do because I was going into a man's world. Leah, in the Christian New Testament, there's a story Jesus tells about the the woman and the unjust judge. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but essentially she just keeps asking. And finally, the, the Bible doesn't say it this way, but finally you could just hear the judge saying, oh, for God's sake, yeah. give that woman what she wants. <laughs> yeah, that was basically the same thing. <laughs> he just said, you're just a troublemaker. Just go in and leave me alone. <laughs> just, just don't call me anymore. That's what, exactly. It's exactly the same. Well, then... Um, <laughs> you tell the story so well in the video. What did they tell you that you couldn't do when you got in there? There was something about they were you weren't going to be allowed to do something. Well, when I went into the into this course, like we were lined up, there was about forty other men from the Soviet Union. There was a few from Argentina and a couple of from Europe. And the commanders didn't want me to be in there. So one of the lieutenants, he basically came up to me because they were eyeing me the whole time, kind of this, in, in, you know, is this intimidation play, this game, right? And he walked up to me, he kind of leans into my ear and he just, all he says was one tear comes out of your eye and I'm going <laughs> to escort you out the gates myself. You know, and, he says, and he says, I'll give you a week. That's what he said. So that was my, 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 my welcome into this course. <laughs> but, but you made it through. Well, I mean, I always go by the motto, what's the best, um, the best revenge, right? The best revenge is succeeding. And the more he wanted me to fail, you know, the more he tried for me to, to, you know, basically crack, the harder I tried, right? So it was good ammunition for me. And I actually ended up graduating from this course in the top, you know, top 90%. So, and since that, actually, that course was now, now open when I, you know, completed it, it's now open to all women. Well, you know, that's often this case, you know, the, the first the first person to crack a barrier, be it woman or or uh, racial or what have you, they usually have to be have a little more moxie than the than those who follow along, don't they? But uh, that's wonderful. So, uh 
I'm guessing you can't tell me a whole lot about what uh, you did in the Secret Service, but how long were you in there, and uh, how long did you serve? Well, I um, I actually worked when I was in the in the police academy. I was actually only in uniform for three months, and the unit that picked me up is called the Belouch, and to get it, and which means in English translation, the closest I can come up with is it's a spying unit. Um, and to get into this unit normally, it takes, you know, three to six years in uniform. And they picked me up within, like, I think it was three or three and a half months, something like that. Um, and it dealt primarily with, with terrorism is, um, getting wanted people, um, and also a little bit of narcotics and stuff like that. But I was also picked up by different branches of, um, intelligence to do different operations. So it wasn't the main thing. A lot of times you'll have two different, um, branches of intelligence working together. And a lot of, because I was, um, the only woman in this particular unit, um, they, I was actually doing a lot of work, a lot of work. Cause I was, like I said, in this particular part in the middle East, I was the only female, um, undercover agent at the time. Well, I think in Israeli intelligence operations, uh, I don't know how mythical it is, but uh, they seem to have a, a, a lot of, uh, have developed quite a reputation. Well, it's a lot of movie stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, the stuff that I did really, it was um, basically identifying people, learning accents. Um, like they would take me through a certain city in, in the Middle East and they'd point at different people and I'd have to identify if it was Arab, Israeli, you know. Uh, an American, a Swedish or whatever list, like I said, um, duplicating accents, uh, getting information, um, a lot of profiling, a lot of surveillance work. It was that kind of stuff. Um, so it was pretty close to James Bond, I guess. <laughs> well, in your CV uh, that I have over here that I've been glancing out as you talk, you make a statement uh, that said the extreme lifestyle of the secret police eventually took its toll and you found your salvation in the bicycle. Mm -hmm. Explain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, it was becoming, uh, the reality was that I didn't expect it to be as dangerous as it was, and it was very isolating. I was very much a loner, and I didn't, um, we were told not to talk to a lot of people about what we did, actually to anybody about what we did. And um, so I kept a lot of things in, and I didn't, this is just on a personal, it was the way that we were handle, handling certain situations. I don't ever remember coming home from, you know, from an assignment saying, wow, we actually did something great for the world. You know, it just felt like we were just covering up, covering up, covering up, you know, you know, when, when poop gets too big and you step on it, it starts to stink. So it just felt like a vicious cycle um, of unsatisfying work and dangerous unsatisfying work. And at the same time, I was struggling with this crazy idea of becoming a professional cyclist at the age of 30. So it was, but at that point, like when I, when that was all going through my head, I didn't think that they would actually let me get out of this to go and pursue this, you know, this cycling career. So I held it off for a couple of years. Well, and as I said, we first came to know you uh, because of you being in the race across America. That's where your name popped up for me, maybe not for others, but that's where I first met you. But you had a professional career before that, didn't you? Yes, I did. I actually started in professional cycling, pro cycling. Um, and, you know, my the goals that I had when I left the Middle East was one was to become a professional, two, to be a national champion. Um, three to win multi-day stage races, you know, that are races over seven days. And my last goal was to win Race Across America because I actually remember watching Race Across America when I was a little kid when it used to be televised. I'm not sure if it was NBC. I don't know what big network. And I always thought, wow, that's a really cool thing to do. Yeah, so I always kind of had that on the radar. And also when I was a pro cyclist, um, I was realizing too that ultra endurance cycling was probably more suited for me just because in pro racing, the harder, the hillier, the longer the races, I started getting better and started getting stronger. And also most importantly is my ability to function under very little sleep. You know, I could, you know, a lot of times in the military, you know, we wouldn't have proper sleeps for up to a week and still to be under those stressful conditions and to function, to be able to use your brain um, and to be very physically active. Um, it's, it was difficult. So, you know, you transition that into cycling. Hey, you got an ultra, a great ultra endurance cyclist. You have some records from your pro years that 
you could tell us I about. do actually I have Mount Baker the a couple of mountain climbs um Seymour uh um Mount Baker Seymour one in the middle middle east um I have the raw record as well so in pro yeah I do I have uh, time trial records um but yeah, we don't really, they don't really go based on, it's more based on wins, right? Because it's really hard to, they don't really have set records in cycling because, you know, yeah. you got the wind conditions and all that yeah. kind of stuff, right. right? We're talking about in track stuff perhaps, but for climbing events, time trialing events, there, there are a few for sure that I broke. Okay, so let's take you to 2011. It's the race across America. So you are ready to take this on. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, that I've, whether you know what about the show or not, is that we've had a, a pretty serious emphasis on women. Uh, that happened not by intention, sort of by default, uh, Leah, more than anything else. And one of my concerns has been the, the, the lack of women participants in some of the endurance events, particularly the longer events. And usually um, uh, we have some that have done very well, but uh, just not enough of them. So how did that go for you? How did 2011 and the Race Across America go for you? Well, I mean, I can honestly say that, um, I mean, I have been a competitive athlete since I was nine years old. So for me, that race, um, it was going to be um, the hardest training session or year I would ever put myself through. I called it commando training, you know, because my goal, of course, was to win and try to set a new record, you know, because I just felt um, I was more uh, naturally gifted to do that kind of training, you know. So f for me, it was, like I said, I basically put my life on a shelf for that race and tried to train in the most uncomfortable conditions as possible to go into that race. Um, of course, not realizing or knowing that there was a condition called Shermer's neck, because as you all know, that's what I suffered. Because I'll be honest with you, I... I didn't race it, I rode it, right? Because after I finished Race Across America, you know that I also did Ring of Fire and then Race Across Oregon, winning both of those. Um, I went for a ride two days later, you know, because I, what I did, the the win in Race Across America didn't justify it with how much I trained, if that makes any sense, because so much emphasis was placed on the neck. I got Shermer's neck at uh, three and a half days into the race, you know, mm -hmm. and everything just went, bananas the crew didn't know what to do i had a totally green crew um they were coming up with all these apparatuses to try and hold my head up you know and then the final solution was basically shaving me from year to year and then taking tensor bandages and braiding it into my hair pulling my head back and then tying it to the back of my heart rate monitor so it was just a a, a struggle um just to get across the finish line but at that point you know because i was on record breaking pace up until that situation happened you know um so that's why it was it kind of when i say a, a bit of a disappointment right just as, again with how much dedication and time i spent that year training for that race and then coming into something that i had no idea it didn't never crossed my mind that i would ever experience anything like that you know we were thinking other things like constipation or diarrhea, all the other all the other great things that happen in Race Across America, but never for a second did I think I'd ever get Shermer's neck. I was discussing this with uh, someone on the show a while back. They were thinking about doing RAM, and they said they they were going to have their their device for dealing with Shermer's neck ready before the race started. Yes, uh, maybe Very smart. Be yeah. <laughs> That's like I always said that the best way not to have rain on a ride is to is to be sure you have your rain gear with you. Yes, or carry an umbrella. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think a lot of it too it has to do with just my crew. Everybody, nobody's done it before. We didn't know anything, honestly, right? I didn't know much about this race. Nobody in my crew, you know, did it before. Um, we had a couple of conversations with Steve Bourne from Hammer, you know, to help us out a bit. But everything was just kind of on a whim, right, you know? So, I mean, we, we did pretty good for being completely green and just going into this, right, with not much, ex with zero experience, actually. But I would definitely do it different. I mean, when I did race across the West, that we had it down pat. And it's like, you know, what Ms. Hogan says is that, you know, most people who do race across America the first time, um, it's not always the best experience. There's a lot of things you learn. And they always do so much better the second time, which makes total sense. And I know that 
if I would ever consider doing it again, there's many, many things I would change, many, many things, uh, including having an apparatus um, on standby just in case a condition like that comes up, right? And that's where we weren't prepared. Well, <clears throat> Leah, um, there's a lot of people who watch this show, or uh, for which I'm happy about, who don't know much about the race across America or endurance cycling. So can you explain to them what we're talking about when we talk about Shermer's neck? Well, I'm, I don't know like, the medical terms of it, but what happens is like all nerve function and muscle function basically collapses, right? So your head drops. And the issue is when your head drops, you can't see the road. And, and it's just the excruciating pain also that shoots down to the middle of your back, down to your, you know, your, your glutes and down your, your, the back of your legs. Um, so I don't know exactly what's happening, but it's very common with people who've suffered from whiplash before or who's, you know, been in some serious accidents, right? And as people who know my background, you know, I've died from a couple of crashes. I've come close a couple of times. So, and it's not also common for women. Usually men get it, right? That's what I was going to say. I, I just don't, can't think of other women who've had it. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing about it, Leah, it seems to me like, it strikes unexpectedly. I mean, um, people who have done the race before and never been bothered with it will have it happen, and th there doesn't seem to be any preparation really for it. Right, but I think too. I mean, I came back came from a pro um, cycling background, and again, when I talk about not being experienced, if you look at my position, because we've taken po photos, my position on my time trial bike, I'm in a very aggressive aero position. You know. I'm in a position that I would race 40 kilometers fast, right? So uh -huh. really, and that's a lot of torque on the muscles in your neck, you know? If you look at other ultra endurers who, who actually have experience, they're more upright, you know? So they're not bent over because in a very aero position, you're kind of aero and then you have to lift your head up. So that's a lot of extra work on your, your, on your muscles. So that too has a lot to do with the bike positioning, me being in a pro position opposed to an ultra endurance position, right? So that's another, um, another reason why it happens so fast. Yeah, so uh, just uh, we want to get on to something else here pretty quickly, but you did the, ra the race across America in 2011 and then the race across the West. Yes. Which, uh, again, for people who are not familiar with, that's the race – that goes at the same time as the race across America on the same route. Yep. But uh, now ends in Durango, Colorado. I don't know where it ended when you did it. They've changed that a little bit. Well, when I did it, it was Durango. Same place. Yeah, yeah. They, they tinkered with that a little bit, and they finally settled on Durango for a number of reasons. That's that's uh, turned out to be a very good choice. Right. Well, now. Um, your life has taken uh, the turn of being a motivational speaker, and uh, you have uh, a, 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 a developed a business around that, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yeah, I. Um, well, when I came back from the Middle East, and you know, I always start my presentations with, you know, the media really loved me when I was in pro cycling. They loved to do interviews on me, um, but they wouldn't. They would ask me maybe one question about cycling, and then everything else was about what I did, you know, in the army, and, and then yeah. you know. And they would just blow up these stories, you know, like a really funny incident was I was at a start line in one race in California and some girl taps me on the shoulder and she whispers to me, you know, is it true that you killed nine people with your bare hands? <laughs> so, you know, and then I go, okay, that's why everyone's so afraid of me. No one's talking to me. I got so much respect in pro cycling, right? So with these kind of stories that started getting out, people started hearing about, you know, the crashes that I'd gone through and my, you know, the, the struggles and all that kind of stuff. So I started to speak. People were hiring me. And what really got to me was, especially when I was speaking to high-risk youth, um, high schoolers, and I talked with uh, uh, a group in Canada it's called Community Futures. That just It's a youth employment program for kids that's you know, had a hard time, a lot of foster kids. And for me, the um, it was the satisfaction because... I had incredible feedback of people coming up to me, not necessarily right after, but sending me emails, you know, one or two weeks after saying something I said had changed their life, you know, or um, helped them get through something. And that feeling of helping other people was bigger than anything I ever experienced, a bigger high than winning a world championship, winning race across America, race across the West, being a national champion. It was undescribable. And I said, wow, if my story is really that powerful, you know, for one, I'm going to finish my books. So I was kind of in the process. 
and I started to go on the speaking circuit a lot more. So I started to kind of snowballed from there, you know, and I have a, a media manager who's helping me right now. I'm, I'm going to be on tour in the States for about another month. We just came back for a month going back. I'm leaving actually tomorrow. So, yeah. yeah. And we were, uh, we had to really uh, squeeze you in here to get the, get this done before you were out again. And right. I have to say that I've watched some of the videos of your speeches and uh, you certainly do a good job at, and uh, I have to say that uh, we'll get on to your book in a moment, but uh, it, it's such a delight to talk with you. I okay. find sometimes, Leah, women, you just almost have to pull their story out of them. You know, uh, I, I, I won't uh, mention the name, but uh, yeah. one of my guests uh, who had just had an, a terrific, broke all kinds of records and so forth, and I asked her about it, and she says, yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, humble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, – but it's such a delight to talk to you. Well, now you have a book out. Tell us about the book, and uh, we'll. Well, actually, this the book that, like I said, um, when I came back from the Middle East, I always had people tell me, "Oh my God, you should write a book. You should write a book." And I thought that was just the craziest thing, um, just because of the things that I went through, and having you know, not knowing that I wouldn't be able to discuss a lot of the things that I did in the Middle East. I thought it was ridiculous. Um, but as I said, when I started going on the speaking circuit and it was the reaction and then I said, you know what, and I was, like I said, I was in the process kind of of recording, um, not really comfortable with it and not finding the right person to write it. But as soon as I did, as soon as I found the right personality to write the book, when we started this project and me reading it, um, and really getting the feedback from some of our um, our readers that were just kind of giving us um, advice and stuff. And they said to me that this book is going to help many, many, many people. And that was the motivator for me to finish it. And it, this is actually a 12-year project for me. So, And, and uh, I may have to pull this out of you. Uh, the name of your book is? It's called No Limits. <laughs> okay. Now, I have to confess uh, – uh, unlike some people I've seen doing interviews like this, and they they make like they've read the whole book. I haven't read it yet. It's okay, on my um, <laughs> it's, it's on my list, okay. but uh, I and I will get to it because um, uh, I I just uh, glanced at a little bit, and I, I'm very happy to do that now. For those of you who are interested in the book, and you will probably see a picture of it uh, right now on the screen. Um, the um, best way to get the book is to go to Leah's website, which is leahgoldstein.com. Very simple. <laughs> and uh, that'll be uh, that should appear on the screen right here as well, so that they can see that. And for those of you who are watching the show on the uh, show website, ohioramshow.com, right below the video where you're watching, you see a link. And if you'll click on that link. That'll take you right to Leah's website, where I believe very top of the page is a place where you can buy the book. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yep. So uh, click on that. If you're watching uh, the show on YouTube or one of the sites that embed the show, uh, you can either type in the, the website you see here uh, on the screen now or uh, just go to OhioRamShow.com and look up this uh the show and, and you'll see uh, the link there where you can just click and go right to it. So, uh, well, Leah, I want to thank you so much for being with us. As I said, I've had you on the radar for some time. And uh, when I saw you had this book out, I thought this is the perfect time to, uh, to uh, catch you and, uh, and get you on the show. Uh, so before we uh, sign off here, uh, have any other comments you'd like to leave with us? Anything we've missed? I just, uh, what, what I, the, the kind of the message I have is really living life to the fullest and just never having any regrets, right? This moving forward. And especially as we get older, it seems like we stop setting goals. You know, so as we get older, we also come up with more excuses. And I said, just keep the momentum, keep the momentum going and, you know, just make those dreams you have, make them your goals. And uh, since I'm a few years older than you, I, and we <laughs> talked about this before we uh, started the show. You have to kind of keep reevaluating what your goals are and, and, and keep something out there. And and I have to say, as I told you before the show started, this show itself has been a, a, a great motivator for me as I've had to adjust to some new realities. And 
and uh, we uh, we appreciate that. Thank you so much for being with with us, Leah, and we wish you the best uh, in the future. And we hope uh, we can uh, uh, push a few copies of your book out there. I know I'm going to get mine just real quick here. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. And do that. Thank you so much, Leah. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Leah, for taking time to be with us for this show. We appreciate that because you were a very busy person trying to squeeze us in between trips. And we appreciate that a great deal. And thank all of you for watching The Ohio Ram Show. We want to thank all of you who support the show. For those of you who give us likes on the social media, who share it on your uh, social media, that's greatly appreciated. It really helps the show to grow. If you'll go to the Ohio Ram Show Dot com website if you're not there now while you're watching it you'll see a place where you could add your email address so you can get notifications of future shows there's a place there where you can leave your comments about the show we always like to hear comments about the show and um, there are some other links there to various places that will give you a little more information about ultra cycling and the race across America thank you for being with us again Goodbye. Music by Kevin McLeod.